I just, I want, I want that intro every time I go out, every time I go out. Uh, I want to tell you about my very first car I ever had. It was a 1979 Volkswagen Beetle Bug, powder blue. No, don't, don't clap, don't clap. It's, it was powder blue because it had been left out in the sun for so long. And uh, this car had many great, many great attributes, one being the air conditioning system. Uh, the air conditioning system was massive. Uh, because that's where the radio used to be. And the air would blow through. That's how I had to get air in the car. Uh, which was very important because I had no uh, way to roll down the windows. All the knobs had been broke off. So I would have to drive this car 45, 50 miles an hour as fast as I could to get the airflow going through. Which was a little tough. It was a centrifugal clutch. And it had bicycle tires, more or less. Now, I didn't want to go too fast. Here's why. The gas gauge was broke. And so for me to know how much gas was in the car, I had to pull the car over, grab a stick, put it down into the gas gauge, and just hope for the best. But this car had a special something about it. It was the fact that it had lasted this long. And I'm not talking about years. I'm not talking about months. I'm talking seven days. That car lasted a sum total of seven days till it blew up on the side of Pine Island Road. And I did the walk of shame all the way back to my house. Legend has it, it's still there today. <laughs> that was my first car. My second car, a little more uh, close to my heart because my second car was the car that I picked up my now wife uh, for our very first date. And if you've ever seen a postage stamp, this car was slightly bigger than that, but not by much. It was a green Honda Civic hatchback. And again, many crazy, amazing attributes that came with this car. The one was, when you got too many people in the car, it would sit so low that the muffler would get stuck between the ground and the car. And it would shoot sparks out the back. But for some reason, only when I made a left-hand turn. So, real quick, do we have any single people in the house? All the single people, raise your hand up. Okay, keep your hands up. All the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. Uh, fellas, look around. Now you know who to talk to. You're welcome. Well, I was single at the time, and I was calling, you know, my, my now wife, but then I was just a girl I was infatuated with. There's no good Christian pickup lines, okay? I'm trying my best. I didn't know what to say. I'm on the phone with her. I'm like, hey, girl. You like Bibles? <laughs> Me too. But in spite of that, in spite of my lack of game, she still uh, decided to go with me to go see Toy Story. Now, the problem arose was the fact that I was trying to calculate how many right-hand turns it would take to get from Cape Coral all the way to the Bell Tower Mall. It's not possible. Sooner or later, I'm going to have to make a left-hand turn. So I got her in the car, we're driving, conversation's going great, we're heading to go see Toy Story, and I, I panicked in that moment because my first left-hand turn was coming up. And I was like, yo, check this out, and I slammed the, the dash like this, and flames shot out the back of the car. I just want to tell you, first off, she was so incredibly, amazingly not impressed. <laughs> Nor should she be. Now, <laughs> I'm exaggerating this story just slightly, but... Here's what I wanted to actually do. I want you right now, you in the audience, I want you to stop for a second. I want you to picture in your mind your very first car, okay? I want you to think about maybe the nickname you gave it. I want you to think about how many miles were on it, how much money you spent, what it looked like. I want you to think about that car for a second, and I want you to imagine that the King of England was coming to Cape Coral on a big, huge cavalcade to make his big, huge entrance. And he walks up to you and says, I need to borrow your car. Now, he's poised at the top of Del Prado, and he's coming all the way down, and there's all this entourage, and people are cheering, people are yelling, and then there you, your car is right at the very front with the King of England. How many people would be on the side of the road going, who is this guy? So I say that because I want to put things in context for today's Palm Sunday, because that's exactly what they said. When Jesus showed up 2,000 years ago on Palm Sunday, that is his exact words that were said in Matthew 21, verse 10. It says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred, and they asked, who is this? Now, we know that Jesus doesn't do anything by accident, does he? Nothing's by accident. Everything has a purpose behind it. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came not on a conquering war horse, but on a lowly, commonplace animal which was a donkey. Now think about that. I know I did. When I first got saved, I'm like, out of all the animals for him to ride in on his big triumphal entry, he picks a donkey. 
A donkey is the equivalent of that time to an average, everyday car or person that we would drive now. But for me, donkeys have been ruined, okay? And I'm going to tell you why. Mostly because of this guy. That guy right there. I mean, he's kind of cute. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I kind of want waffles right now or something like that. But anyway, donkeys have been ruined in my mind because in my mind, I think, uh, you know, that's enough of that. I think donkeys average every day. And that's exactly what Jesus chose to use. So today, I know today's Palm Sunday, and sometimes in church world we think, well, Palm Sunday, that's kind of like the pregame before the Super Bowl, which is next week, right? Easter, right? We think about it in that term. Maybe you thought when you came today, well, there might be some kids at the front, you know, they're waving some palm branches, and we're going to go in, high five, and we'll be out of here. But can I submit to you that maybe there's some things that we're missing? That if Jesus does everything by purpose, that there's a reason behind what he did? Can I submit to you today that Jesus came to bring peace? Could I introduce you today to the Prince of Peace? Could we talk about the King of Kings today? Could we talk about the Alpha, the Omega, the Lion of Judah? Because that's who rode in that day. He rode in that day, and he rode in to bring peace. I think we'd all admit that we are a world right now that is desperately looking for peace. We are living in a time where we are desperately looking for peace. And if you don't believe me, we are just coming out of a pandemic season where the use of anti-anxiety medication increased by 34%, all-time high. We're coming out of a time where weed sales in multiple states hit record highs. Pun intended. We are coming out of a season where there was 375,000 more Google searches about panic attacks. And if you still don't believe that we're desperately looking for peace, take one look over in what's happening in the Ukraine right now. If you still don't believe me, head to Miami around 2 o'clock, try to drive the speed limit. You'll see a lot of people not at peace right then. <laughs> Somebody who's from Miami. But I want to take it a little step further and just be personal. When I was in seventh grade, I was 12 years old. Let me preface this by saying I did not know who Jesus was. And I remember sitting in my room and all of a sudden I just coughed, like, <clears throat> like that, right? But then the cough turned into a second cough. And the second cough turned into a third cough. And then I started to notice that I was starting to cough, but I couldn't control it. I tried to stop it, but I couldn't. And then it started to turn into coughing fits that were so intense that I couldn't even barely talk. Now, my parents could hear me in the other room. They came in. They're trying to figure out what's wrong with me. I don't even know. I'm just 12. I don't really know what's happening to my body at the time. So they throw me into the car. We're heading as fast as we can to the emergency room, and I'm just getting worse and worse as we drive. I'm getting worse and worse. And the funny thing was, the minute we pulled into the parking lot of the emergency room, my coughing stopped immediately. Now, if you take a beach ball and you set up to the, to the beach or you head up to the pool or whatever, you go into the water, and you just try to shove that beach ball under the water, it's going to take all your strength to hold it down there, won't it? It's going to take all your strength to hold it down, to push it down, to not let it pop back up. Well, that's what I was in my life at the time. I was, I was an angry kid. I was a bitter kid. I had some stuff go down in my past. I wasn't, I wasn't in a good space. And so I was taking all those emotions, but I just kept pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down, not dealing with it. And my body started to react. That's where that came from. And I had stopped coughing because really all I wanted to have was a conversation with my parents. And I would wager to say in a room this big with this many people, those that are watching online, you might be doing the same thing. You might have anxiety that has just got a grip on you, but instead of dealing with it, instead of you bringing it to God, instead of doing whatever you could, you just keep shoving it down, shoving it down, shoving it down, shoving it down. And I think we would all admit that we're living in a society where it's big business on making you feel at peace, at least temporarily. There's more money to be made on treating your symptoms than there would ever be on offering you a cure. And as the quote goes, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. I think that's why we need to go and find out what God has to say. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that 2,000 years ago, you did not leave us alone. 2,000 years ago, you came with a purpose and with a plan, and it was to come and to bring us peace, God, peace between each other, peace in our own hearts, but most importantly, peace with you. 
God, we desperately need that today. We desperately need you to show up and show out and be exactly who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at the Palm Sunday context. We're going to look at Luke chapter 19, verse 28 through 40. But I felt like it's just important that we at least set the stage, right? So you have to understand, Jesus lived on this earth for 30 years, and he lived just really as a peasant. He lived running the family business. Uh, he never, it says he never did a miracle up until his 30, around approximately his 30 years old of age. That's when he begins his ministry. And Jesus only actually did his ministry for three years. But in those three years, man, he started turning the world upside down, didn't he? He's raising the dead. He's touching lepers. He's healing them. He's telling us that we need to love each other. But he's also flipping over tables. He's doing a lot of things in those three years. He's gathering his disciples. And so if this is a movie, what we're actually looking at at Palm Sunday, we're looking at the last scene of the movie. So at the time, when Jesus showed up for Palm Sunday, what well, wasn't called Palm Sunday, but when he showed up, it was the Passover week. And so the population in Jerusalem had just swollen huge. And we're talking anywhere between, they say, a couple hundred thousand to maybe possibly two million people were in Jerusalem that day. So there's people everywhere. Can you imagine if our city just blossomed all overnight, just all of a sudden we hit a million people? There would be people everywhere, right? And that's what it was. And so they would build these tents, these booths out of palms, and so there was palms everywhere. On top of all this, we're talking about a society that was at political unrest, societal unrest, religious unrest. And on top of that, Israel wasn't even a country. It had been occupied and had been taken over by the Romans. And that's when Jesus makes his entrance. That's when he shows up to do what he's been put there to do. And so I want to do something a little different for Palm Sunday, if that's okay, if you could humor me. What we're going to see today is three videos. They're called the Lumo Project. And we're going to actually see scripture narrated, word for word. Because sometimes we might actually miss it when we read it. And so just to give you that setting, that's where we're going to pick up. Let's watch this first video. Here we go. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany, at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Now again, I'm a young Christian. The first time I ever read this story, I don't, I don't really understand why was it so important for him to, to take a donkey in. Not even just a donkey, but it says the, the colt of a donkey. And so, like I said before, Jesus never does anything by accident. He does everything with a purpose. Everything has a reason behind it. And so, first of all, he did this to fulfill Scripture because Zechariah 9.9 says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. So first, Jesus did this for a reason. He did that because those in Jerusalem that knew the scripture would know that the Messiah, the king, the anointed one, was going to come this way. And so if they saw him showing up, they knew, first of all, that scripture was being fulfilled. But contextually and culturally, here's the thing that we might miss, is that Jesus did this because if a king came into a city on a donkey, it meant to everyone that saw that he was coming in peace. He wanted to let everyone know that day his very purpose. His purpose was to bring peace. Now, when I say that, I mean peace in our own lives, peace in our own minds. I mean peace with each other. But most importantly, peace with God. And when I say peace with God, that's a phrase that we might miss. So can I pause for a second and just explain what peace with God really means? You've messed up. I've messed up. We've all done things that God says don't do. And the consequence of those mess-ups is to be separated from God forever. This is what the Bible calls sin. Sin is to shoot for a target, but to miss the target. God's standard, God's target that we're supposed to shoot for is His holiness, His perfection. And we fall short, don't we? And because of that, because God is holy and we're not, because God is perfect and we're not, He cannot allow sin in His presence. 
And so the consequence of this is that we would be separated from God forever in hell. That's what that is, to be tormented, separated forever from God in hell. And if this is where the story ends, we're all in big trouble. But aren't you glad that's not where the story ends? Because this is why Jesus comes. This is why these last five days of his life, this is why it's so incredibly important. Because what he's coming to is to go to the cross. And on that cross, God will pour out his wrath onto his son. And his son, being the perfect, sinless sacrifice, will take your punishment and my punishment. And now all he asks is that we would just turn to him. The Bible calls this repentance. And that's just a big Bible word. It meant that you have a change of mind. It meant you were heading one way, and now you're heading the other. You've been living for your life the whole entire life. I don't need God. I don't need church. I don't need none of that. And then all of a sudden, Jesus gets a hold of you. go, I'm going the other way now. I'm heading his way. His way is the right way. My way took me the wrong way, didn't it? This is what the gospel is. And as I began to look at this, and I began to look at the donkey, and I thought, Again, very interesting to me. And I don't want to read more into scripture that's not there. But here's what I did find out, which I find fascinating. Is that the donkey, one, is the only animal outside of the snake that ever talked in the Bible. (laughs) But two, the donkey is the animal that actually its fur makes a cross on its back. So isn't it interesting to think that as Jesus was riding on that donkey and everybody's cheering for him, we got him, we got the king, he's here, he's coming in, but all he sees when he looks down is the cross before him. Because that's why he came. He came because the cross was before him. And he did not come on a war horse to conquer and to kill. He wasn't sitting above us. No, he's coming on a colt at eye level with the people. Jesus deals with us in a very personal way, doesn't he? He deals with this in a one-on-one way. He's right there with us. And I'm so glad he is. I'm so glad he came. Let's pick up where we left off. Let's watch the next video. Check this out. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. There's three people in that passage. There's the donkey owners, there's the disciples, and then there's the religious insiders, a.k.a. the Pharisees. And we all kind of fall into one of those. So let's look actually at the, at the guys that really we don't ever talk about, right? The donkey owners. Like, we never even know who they were. It gets kind of passed over because we're seeing the bigger picture of the story. But I have to stop and think about that for a second. Because imagine if someone just rolls up to your house, walks in, grabs your car keys, you got two people there, jump in your car, start their stuff, <laughs> and they're just about to head on down the road. And they're like, wait, what are you doing? They can't take my car. Oh, uh, Jesus needs it. You'd be like, I'm about to send you to see Jesus. I'm going to call the cops on you, man. But that's the equivalent of what happened there. Jesus says, hey, why don't you go get that donkey? If they bother, to, if they stop and say, why are you taking it? You just say, the Lord has need of it. And I find it interesting when we heard that, we never hear the donkey owner go, no, you can't have that. He was like, all right, go for it. That makes me think that that owner or those owners, they must have known who Jesus was. They must have known him so much that when the disciples said, the Lord has need of it, they're like, the Lord Jesus? Absolutely, take it. The donkey owners were so committed to giving everything over to Jesus that the one thing that they had, which was probably their biggest possession, they're like, let him use it. They woke up that morning as another average day. They walked that donkey and the colt on out. But they went to bed that night knowing that God used them to fulfill scripture. Did you know God wants to use you? Me? 
you want to use me? Yeah, absolutely. God uses very ordinary people to do some extraordinary things, doesn't he? He's not concerned as much with your ability as your availability. You may go, Jesus wants to borrow my car. Have you seen my car? It's filled with Cheerios in the back. I wish whoever don't work right. <laughs> that same car can get somebody to church. That same car can be used by God to round up the kids in your neighborhood and go, come on, man, why don't you come to kid life? It's awesome. God just wants to use what you have, and he can use it because Jesus needs you. He doesn't have to use you, but he wants to. We get to be a part of that process. The second group we see in that passage is the disciples. Now, you would not miss the disciples back then because everywhere Jesus went, they kept yelling. They kept yelling everywhere he went, make way for the king. He's coming. Hosanna. They were the loudest bunch in the group. You could not miss them. In fact, it says they took their cloaks, and they put it on the donkey, and then they threw their cloaks right in front. So the cloak back then, that was their everything. That was their bed. That's what you used as collateral. They were essentially saying, all that I have is for you, Lord. All that I got is for you, Lord. I'm so excited, I'm just going to keep shouting. Now, this morning, when you walked in here, maybe your praise was a little bit louder today because Jesus is doing some big things in you today. Maybe your worship was a little bit louder today because you're going through some junk and you need God to show up. Maybe your praise and your worship was a little more loud because you're just crying out, God, I need you. There's a difference between a follower and a disciple. And those disciples, they were shouting it out. Everywhere Jesus went, they were shouting it out. There is another level to our walk with God, and that's being a disciple. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do a little shout practice. Pastor, he said it all. I'm going to do one more with the idea that imagine Jesus was about to come right down this aisle. Can you imagine that? Now, some of you are like, well, that's not really my style. I get it. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. Like, I'm not trying to make you feel like, well, I'm kind of an introvert. Like, you know, I worship here. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you're going a little higher. You know what I mean? Like, I forgot to put deodorant on. Like, I'm about to worship here. Don't make me embarrassed, Pastor Jonah. I'm not here to do that. But can I just push you a little further? Can we just go a little further? Can we imagine just for one minute that the king is about to come and he's about to roll on down here and we're going to give him a standing ovation? One, two, three, make some noise. Come on. Yes, Lord. Everybody got Pentecostal real fast. <laughs> Here's the deal. You know who wouldn't have liked that? The Pharisees. The religious people would have told you, be quiet. Sometimes it's the religious people that don't get it. They miss it the most, don't they? They'll tell you things like, well, it's okay to go to church. Just don't go overboard, man. They'll say, it's okay to read your Bible for inspiration, just don't take it literally. They'll say things like, keep your personal relationship with God just that, personal. And they knew about Jesus, but they didn't know him personally. If you might miss it, they referred to him as teacher. They said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They didn't say, Lord, rebuke your disciples. They didn't say, King, rebuke your disciples. Son of God, rebuke your disciples. They said none of that. They said, teacher, why? Because most people have no problem with Jesus, the good moral teacher. It's the minute you start to say, well, he was God in the flesh. Then certain people, religious people, can start getting a little mad about that, don't they? When you start to say he was the king of kings, he was the Lord of lords, he was the son of God, he was the part of the trinity, he was those things. When we start to say that, they go, ah, shut up, quiet, be quiet, that's enough, enough, I don't want to hear that. He's just a teacher. Well, I love Jesus' response, isn't it, when it comes to the disciples, what did he say? Well, yeah, I could tell him to be quiet, but then the rocks are going to start shouting. Yeah, I could tell him to be quiet. You know what he's saying there? He's saying all creation sings of the glory of God. I'm sorry, we can be quiet, but when I step outside and I see that beautiful sunset, it is shouting out, my king is risen. When I look at the universe and the way it was created, it is screaming out to the glory of God, who he is, what he is, what he does. So yeah, we can be quiet, but we're just going to get out shouted. 
And so today we have to be very careful that we don't fall into the wrong category there. Because those Pharisees, those religious insiders, they did shout something. They just didn't shout it that day. Five days later, they shouted, crucify him. Let's look at the last passage. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Now, what's interesting about this passage is how just a little bit before he's a celebrity, but by the time he reaches here, people don't even recognize him, do they? He goes from celebrity, number one trending topic on Twitter, he goes from that to complete missing person. What does that tell me? It tells me that what breaks God's heart is when he shows up, but we miss him. What he said in that passage, he said, if you'd only recognize me when I had shown up, I would have brought peace. I would have brought peace to your life. I would have brought peace between each other, peace into your own heart, and peace with God. I would have brought these things to you. But because you missed me, now I'm actually hidden from you. He actually goes on to say that enemies are coming, and they're coming sooner or later. Now, this was fulfilled literally in AD 70 when the Romans showed up, and they burned the city down. But this is figuratively also because you have enemies that are after you. The enemy is most importantly sin, but you have all kinds of enemies that want to take your peace, all kinds of enemies that want to ruin your relationship with God, all kinds of enemies are coming for you. And today, if you miss him, those enemies will catch up to you sooner or later. You can't sow to the flesh and not expect to reap from it. And he even goes on to say in that passage that the enemies not only will come, but it's going to hit you and your family. And this is what we call generational curses. Because your great-grandfather might have missed surrendering his life to Jesus, and so he turned to all kinds of different things that the world can offer, be it alcohol, be it abuse, be it whatever, fill in the blank. And he took that, and he passed that along to his kid, which was your grandfather, who passed it along to your father, and now it's coming down to you, so you have a choice right now today, will I stop that? Because we can break the generation curse today, can't we? Amen. Aren't you glad? Today or your life can be the one that stops it. So your kids and their kids' kids and their kids' kids, they walk in freedom. They walk in freedom because you didn't miss Jesus when he showed up. I'm so excited for that today. Today God is saying, don't miss his time. When we rolled in, palms were everywhere, so they just started grabbing them and they were shouting out something something that's very significant, something that, that is a phrase that we use in our worship time, and it's the phrase that is Hosanna. But we have to understand, when they were shouting that out, some of them, Hosanna meant the original context. The original context meant save us, liberate us, give us favor. Because a lot of the Jewish people at that time when Jesus showed up, they were upset about the politics of their day. They thought Jesus could be the political warrior, messiah, savior. In other words, he could fix, fix our messed up country instead of fixing our messed up lives. You have to understand something. They were in this mess because of themselves. God's word promised, God said to Israel, if you'll follow me, if you'll seek after me, if you'll put me first, I will always protect you as a country. But the minute you start to run after idols, the minute you start to run after sin, the minute you start to run after foreign gods, I'll take my hand off, and those other countries are going to come in, and they're going to oppress you. And that's where they were. Rome had taken over Israel. And so they were shouting out and waving those branches all around. They were shouting out Hosanna, but they were saying, liberate us, save us be a political savior, be a messiah. But let's stop and think about all the times God, you asked God to remove you from a situation that actually resulted from your own sin rather than asking God to forgive you and rescue you from the sin that got you there in the first place. 
often as Christians, we focus on the enemies, the little E, instead of focusing on the enemy, big E. The phrase Hosanna reminds us about who liberated us from sin, and that was Jesus. The same ones that shouted, save us, and wave those branches, are the same ones in five days that might have been shouting, crucify. This is what happens when we create a Jesus of our own version, rather than the version that he actually is. They shouted, Hosanna. So my question to you today is, what are you crying out? What's your Hosanna today? What are you crying out to him? Are you even doing that? Because there was four different types of people in the audience that day when Jesus rode in on that donkey. Four different types. The first type was the ones that wanted Jesus to be some military liberator, Messiah, kill off the Romans type guy. God, forgive us. Forgive us, God, for making you what we want you to be. The second one in that audience is probably the Romans. And they see Jesus coming in. He's got this little crew, and they're yelling, they're shouting. But they're Romans, right? They're cultured. They know it all, don't they? Right? Who's that guy over there making all that racket? I don't know. He's some guy from Nazareth. Nazareth? That little town? Ain't nothing good coming from there. Ah, but, he, you know, he's like, he's, he's done some stuff. I don't see him doing nothing. And they went right about their business for the rest of the day, didn't they? We have to be careful that we don't ignore Jesus when he shows up. Right? That's where I feel like a lot of the world is today. Yeah, Jesus, kind of good guy, knows some good stuff, but that's not really part of my life, right? The third wanted to obey him. The owner of the donkey eagerly said, take what I have and use it. He wanted to be all in. Today, you can be that person. You can move from just being a follower to being a disciple. I want to be a disciple. I want to be the one, when I walk in the room, I change the atmosphere of that room. I want to be that person. I want to be the disciple. I want to worship him. I, I can't help but shout about what God has done in my life, and I got to talk about it. I got to shout it. What will your Hosanna be today? Let's stand to our feet. I want to pray for you today if you are struggling with a lack of peace I believe God can show up and he can break that if you are not having peace between someone else he can help you know what that means but today also if you've not surrendered and had peace with God today can be the day that you do that so let me pray for you today father I lift up this crowd to you right now those that are here I feel like even right now, if you're struggling with lack of peace, you can just raise your hand up. Let me pray for you right now. If that's you, raise it up. Don't be ashamed. It's nothing to be afraid of. If you are struggling today and you say, I don't have that peace in my life, lift that hand up as your way of saying, God, I surrender. If you're here today and you say, well, you know what? I don't even have peace with God. I've not surrendered my life to him. If that's you, you can raise that hand up right now. This is your way of saying, God, I give you my all. Father, I come before you right now. I pray for these hands. I pray for those that are in this room that are lacking in your peace. God, today, would you break that stronghold? God, would you be that provision in them? God, would you be exactly what they need? Would you show up just like you did 2,000 years ago? Would you show up in peace to bring that to them? Lord, we need you. We desperately need you. Help us to be reminded of who you are, what you are, what you do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God a hand clap one more time? Yes, Lord. Stay standing. Just to remind you, 6 p.m. tonight, Kingdom Builders will be meeting right here in the main auditorium. And next week is Easter. Three services, 8, 9.30, and 11.15. Make sure you invite your neighbors and everyone. And just like we always do at the end, I get the honor to do this. I'm so excited to do this. It's like a big deal. We say this right before we go out. So on the count of three, I want you to shout it out as loud as you can. One, two, three. You guys have a blessed Sunday. See you next week. The prayer team will be out here.